First thing I want you to do if you brought a lunch, make that noise now. Feel free to eat during this. This is a brown bag. It's a lunch and learn. So please, uh, this is one of the things that we have strived to do uh, for our lecture series program is create opportunities for you guys to learn. We focus on your children during the day, uh, but as parents, we need to have information so that we have an idea of what's going on down the road. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Hancock Bank. Um, they have made this possible for us to bring in Phenomenal lecture series speakers, um, and uh, such as Julie Fowdy uh, a month ago or so. Uh, and it also allows us to create opportunities for all of you in our school community. And we'll do this twice a year uh, as a brown bag lunch series. And then we're also working on what we're going to be doing for our winter lecture series. So thank you, Hancock Bank. Um, four years ago, we moved here five years ago, four years ago, uh, in order to get to know Tallahassee, uh, I had the opportunity to be a part of Leadership Tallahassee, which was a phenomenal program. Uh, one of the first things they do is they throw you on two buses with a bus uh, or two buses uh, to go to Jacksonville for a weekend with complete strangers. And lo and behold, I sat right next to. Did you really? I did. Um, <laughs> now Strandberg, and there are a variety of different professions on that bus, and I was very fortunate as an educator to sit next to Nell because we were able to talk about what she does and what I do. Um, and she is a phenomenal education, went to Vanderbilt, went to Tulsa Law, um, raised her kids, and then decided to, 10 years ago, create this need, which is a need here in Leon County and in Tallahassee, to help parents uh, kind of guide you through high school so that you can prepare for college. Because uh, when your kids get into high school, it's a word. Um, and before you know it, you're, they're going off to college. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have Nell here. Uh, I've gotten to know her over the past four years, um, and I'm thrilled that she has this opportunity to speak to all of you. So welcome, Nell Schreiber. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As Peter said, I have um, 10 years ago, I guess I'm in my 11th year of doing independent college consulting in Tallahassee. And when I started my business, nobody knew what an independent college consultant was. Um, so from that point, people have begun to realize that our high school counselors have way too many students to really help on a one-on-one -on -one basis on the college process. And that's where I step in as somebody outside of the school system where families hire an independent to help them get through the college process. I saw on the uh, flyer that it was Holly called it the college admission game, which it truly is. And how many people graduated college from 1990 to 1995? Raise your hand. Okay. Things have changed. Things have changed. Um, I graduated from Vanderbilt in 1980, and my father made me write that tuition check when I when it was due, and I could barely get all those words on that line. But I remember how much it cost, and it was 24 and change for a semester, five thousand dollars. I have the flyer. If, you know, you all need a flyer. You, you all need the talking points so you don't have to take as many notes. Um, but it is now $45,000 for tuition and fees at Vanderbilt. It's a lot of money. And when I went 500s or below, we're okay to get into Vanderbilt. I have had some of my clients who have visited Vanderbilt in the last couple of years have said that they will tell you in the information session if you don't have 700s, on each part of the SAT, don't bother. It's not happening. So things have have changed. When you know the rules, you can play better. That's true of any game, isn't it? When you know what's happening, you can do better. What do colleges want? Because when you know what they want, you can do a better job in preparing your child in fulfilling those. They want four years in high school of the five core courses. That's math, science, social studies, English, and a foreign language. They also would like students to get to the terminal class in subjects. That would be AP Physics, that would be AP Lit, and what else, you know, the AP foreign languages. And so we have to realize that 
all of our students can't get to the terminal class and everything and you need to choose courses appropriately but they also want them to take rigorous courses and they would like them to get as far along as they can they also want givers who have a passion and have been leaders and I have some books out there on the lower bookshelf there and feel free to look at them and one of them is a newspaper article that came out September 4th and said we have too much passion in our world now and it's so true I hate I hate the term passion but they want the students to have focus might be a better word to use but they want them to be doing one big thing how many people when they went off to college did you hear we wanted you to be a well-rounded student anybody hear that line okay they don't want well-rounded students anymore they don't care they will craft a well-rounded class so if you are a computer geek and you spend all your time doing computer that's perfectly fine that's perfectly fine because you will be balanced out with the musician and the football player and the leader of the student government so if you're a student I have I have one student this year who is an equestrian and that is all that's takes an awful lot of time and that's fine and that's fine so you don't have to be quote well-rounded but they would like you to have something where you are spending a lot of your time they want kids to have terrific ACT and SAT scores and you all know that that's changing in March maybe the SAT is changing this year um, well 2016 and they want full pay students they would love to not have to give any money to a student and have them come in and pay money so that that's a good credential to have if you can give a, be a full paid student what do parents want oftentimes they want a name brand school they want a college where their child will thrive because it's so important if they can gain that confidence during those years that will just launch them into their career I also hear that they would like a lot of scholarship money and they would like to have their child be employed when they graduate and off the parental payroll <laughs> whether that will be four or six years I do want to give you a hint when you look at graduation rates they are all six year rates they do not give a four-year graduation rate you need to know where to go to get a four-year graduation rate so just be assured just be aware when you're planning out your money is not four times twenty thousand at a state university it is six times twenty thousand does that mean that your child cannot graduate in four years no your child can graduate in four years but the culture among the students is six years so when you see that rate it is a six-year rate and just be aware of that if and if you all if you all want to ask a question you can raise your hand during this and then we'll just be aware if it starts going too long I'll say hold on to your questions and I'll speed through the rest and then we'll go questions okay so then define the culture that has moved us to six years is it taking time off and part of the school you know what is it the, what causes the six mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. Part of it is they think 12 hours is a full load. Well, we know that you can't get through in four years if you're just taking 12 hours. Part of it is they have to pick a major during orientation. And all of a sudden, they pick a major and they get into that first or second semester. Woo! Uh, I'm not going to be able to make three more years of this. And then they have to go back and take the prereqs for another major some of them are working too many hours and not taking care of business in in the classroom um, like working like a job a job okay. a job and so I think those are probably picking too early I mean you can always go in undecided and take the broad prerequisite prerequisites 
and then get to your get to your major. Um, and but when they go in and they declare a major, another another example is when my son was at UCF, and um, after sophomore year there were majors that you would then apply to get into. One of them was speech therapy. Somehow they had backed up in allowing the kids in that though you were admitted to speech therapy after your sophomore year or the tail end of your sophomore year, there were no classes for you to take that next year. But to stay in the queue to start speech therapy the following year, you had to take a year of courses that you didn't really need to then get into the major that you wanted. So limited access programs can sometimes cause an issue. Okay, um, what can you do to help your child get where he wants to go, get where you want to go? And I want you to, when you are looking at helping your child, even as young as sixth, going into seventh, Think about the end game. Where are they going to be their senior year? And I know we all get excited when our child gets to start algebra in seventh grade because we get a pat on our back because we've got a smart kid and we've done a good job. But that track takes them to calculus BC their senior year. That's third semester college calculus. How many of y'all took? I was an econ major. I don't even think I took third semester calculus, much less my senior year of high school. So look at the end and see where it progresses to. Some kids can do it, but let's not get too excited about I can. My kid is in this math now, because what happens oftentimes is, and, and I had this explanation given to me by one of the assistant principals at Leon High School. Algebra 1 and Geometry, if you have a smart kid and you have a hard-working kid, it's kind of like laying a brick wall. They can do it. They can get through it. When you get to that Algebra 2, there's abstract thinking. So now they're in the high school, and it may be a real change if they've gone to a, a public high school. And they've been a math whiz, now all of a sudden, they're not getting Algebra 2 because their brain has just not matured for that abstract thinking. <coughs> and the tutoring isn't helping, they just can't do it. And now they hate math. And they're struggling, and school's not as fun. But what's worse is, now they don't like math, and they're backing off of the accelerated math sequence. Colleges look at that. And they may tell you, oh, mom, I'm going to take AP stat. That's good. It's an AP class. When you're on an accelerated track to get to calculus, stat is a back off of taking calculus. So just beware and look at where your child will be senior year. Even engineers. I, I will tell you, if you've got a child who wants to be an engineer, they do need calculus, at least the AB calculus, their senior year. But otherwise, they don't, they don't need BC. And even so, I, I tell parents, we get caught up in, in AP. We're going to save all this money in college because they're not going to have to take those courses. But there's a couple of things that you may not realize. One. Um, I had a, my older child is very bright, and he probably went in with 30 credits going, which is a full year of school, going into, going into college. But what happens is when they start skipping those freshman level classes because I have AP Calc, now, who are they competing against? Sophomores or juniors who have had a year to figure out how college works. They've been away from home for a year. They've learned to deal with roommates. They understand laundry. They understand all this stuff. So when you are thinking that this is great, you know, he can, he can be further ahead, 
maybe stepping back and not getting credit even though he got a 5 on the AP Calc and having him retake calculus that freshman year, one, he's going to feel pretty confident. He's also going to get a nice grade in it if he shows up. <laughs> um, so there's nothing wrong with that. But I, do, I think oftentimes parents here take these AP classes. Now, they're going to need some AP classes. I don't want you to walk out of here saying, don't take any AP classes. I think they probably need five to seven. So they do need some AP classes. But I really want you to play to your child's strengths, where they are gifted in the subject matters that they're going to be taking. So, um, and the other thing is, when they take that intro course, particularly let's say it was engineering, I, I had somebody that, um, just a friend, not a, not a client, that the child on his own had taken Calculus BC, AP Calculus BC on his own, and went to Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech said, I don't care, you're taking Calculus 1 because we want you to know that foundation because our Calculus 1 teachers know what Calc 2, Calc 3, Calc 4 wants. So even though he did well on the exam, Georgia Tech at that point didn't care. You were taking their calculus. So um, it can help in electives in the end. It can help maybe get them out of some subjects they don't particularly like. My child, my older child, never took a science, which is a shame, but he had enough AP credits that he didn't have to take a science class when he was in college. Um, Foreign language, I understand you guys have foreign language here. I also want you, and, and it's wonderful, um, you get a lot more than a foreign language when you take a foreign language. Uh, so, but I want you to understand colleges, there's a couple things. Colleges want to see what a student does when he or she is not required to do something. So if a student is required to take two years of a foreign language to get into college, which is pretty much what you have to do, um, they want to see if you will carry on and go beyond the bare minimum. Because they don't want minimalist kids. They want kids to really go forward. So if you're taking that language, they need to carry on. I And, and colleges are all different. I, I tell my families... I'm telling you what the tippy-top colleges want. Are there a lot, a lot of colleges that don't require as much? Yes. But we don't know at the beginning where your child's going to land. So you have to keep your options open. And so they, you have a question? Uh, just when you're done, before you move on to the next subject, I'm okay. about foreign language. So they would like you, the child to have four years in high school. <laughs> Four years of a foreign language is a, is a big one, and it's sometimes hard to sell a kid to take that fourth year. But if they can carry on and get to the terminal class, which will probably be, and if they're starting in seventh, will probably be in 11th grade with an AP, if your school doesn't offer anything more, you're done. You're done. But they don't want them to say, I just took this two years in middle school and nothing else in high school because I got that taken care of. They can always switch a language too if they want to going into the high school. But what if you have a child who's already fluent? My son is fluent in Spanish. How do I go about making that a part of the application or do I make sure that he takes advanced Spanish? I would talk whatever high school your child goes to and decide with the counselor and the Spanish teacher what would be appropriate because I think sometimes putting a ninth grader in with juniors and seniors is tough um, and also maybe there might be a situation where the child can do something that the teacher can give him extra stuff to do even though it's a lesser class um, than his capabilities. So what matters is, is the class, not that they speak the language. Say again? So what matters is that they take a class, 
know that they speak the language. Like I understand situation. My kids they speak both English and Spanish. So it's a class. It's a class. It's a class. Mm -hmm. That's right. Don't take another language. If you're fluent in one, they don't no, you, you to try another language. No, you could. I mean, in that case, if he's if fluent in Spanish, take French, mm -hmm. take Latin, mm -hmm. take something else. Chinese. Chinese, but not a lot of them offer that <laughs> in our in our high schools. So that's another way to switch it up to do that. So, okay. Um, your child needs to be involved in school, community, church, synagogue, and um, in those areas. Sometimes, I think we all know that sometimes leadership roles are popularity contests, and our child might not be the one winning that contest. But there are a lot of leadership roles that they can get outside of the school system. And so being aware, like a Rotary Youth Leadership Award is a leadership camp that's available. The Tallahassee Police Association, or the Tallahassee Police have a leadership program in the summer that's really pretty fantastic. And Youth Leadership Tallahassee is something sophomore year that they can apply for and do their junior year. So, and even in their church um, or synagogue, they can, there's things that they can do to have those leadership roles. And it doesn't always have to be a title role, but something that they are doing that they make a difference in the organization they're with. That's, that's a big thing. You can be a president of a club and run meetings, and that club does nothing, and the upper level colleges really don't care how many presidential positions you hold if you can't show them that you've made a difference in that in that organization. Ready to go on? Activities. Um, I had a grandmother type before my um, older one got into school and she said keep them busy, keep them tired. And there's a lot of good in that maxim. You need to allow them time to do their schoolwork. Absolutely. That's number one. And I have had sad stories where people think, but he's in Scouts, and he's an Eagle Scout, and he's done this, and he's done that. But his grades aren't anywhere near mm -hmm. where they need to be. School needs to be first. School needs to be first. They're looking. It's an, it's an educational institution you're applying to. They want grades. They want to know that it was important. Did you, did you talk about why we need to save? Oh, I didn't. I skipped time? that. So let me go back. I'm glad you said that. Um, so now let me go back because I skipped it. When the kids um, make their resume, there are certain things that I use. And in one of the books over here, um, it's if you're getting ready for college admissions, get the facts, the truth about getting in. And actually the book opens to the resume page because this is the one I use. And I put my son's resume, because I can, I can put his out here. Mm -hmm. um, and you all can look at that if you want. But that's, that's where I got my resume numbers from, or resume format from. They want to know how many hours per week and weeks per year your child does everything. And so, when we are sitting down, I, um, what you'll find out is that the semester report cards and transcript does not tell whether you earned high honor roll or honor roll. Your quarterly report cards tell you whether you earned. You can figure it out, but if you don't have those quarterly report cards, they don't keep track of that. And so you can't figure it out because you, don't, you only have semester grades. So keep the quarterly report cards. Also, any certificates or awards, I used, to, I used to frame in cheap little frames for my kid, but I'd make a photocopy of it and put it in a file so that I could remember when he won this award to put on the resume. ACT and SAT test scores, volunteer hours, keep track of them, athletic practice and game schedules. How many of you have athletes at home? It's a lot of hours, isn't it? 
They have no idea how many hours it is. But when I'm sitting with the student and we are creating a resume, I say, when does, when does, when does practice start in August? Uh, August 15th. Okay. How many hours did you practice that Monday? We get a calendar out. How many hours did you practice that Monday? How many hours did you practice on Tuesday? When was this game? Did you have to travel? University of Texas, unbelievably, I do a general four-year number. They want hours freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, and senior year. And um, so you, you need to know where, where they traveled, when they did stuff. And one of the things you might do is just have a calendar at home and on a Friday or a Sunday or whatever, let's go back and September 15th, that week, what, um, <coughs> what was practice like? What did you do? Maybe you had a doctor's appointment and didn't go to practice. You know, where this game was travel and you have to count travel time. So it's, it's very detailed and that's why I say to save that. Or even if they are musicians and they're practicing band in high school, it takes a lot of time. And if they're going to games and you need to account for all that time. Because the more fully they can put that down on their application, the better chance that they have of getting admitted because a lot of kids will try to do it in their head as they're filling out the application. And so what I would suggest to you is the common application is an application that 500 to 700 colleges use now. You can go in and get in there and create a file for you. Go in and see what a college application looks like now. See what's on there. Page four is usually where the activities are. And um, you get in there and it will give you new respect of what they have to know on their resume in accounting, in accounting for all of that. Um, so that's why, so thank you very much for pointing that out. But that's, that's why that's important. Say back to the band thing, if they're not a part of the school band, but they do play the piano a lot or the guitar a lot or something like that, and it's countless private lessons that you've gone through, you know, do you still count that as well? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I, some people play it at their church. Right. Um, but all the practice, all the lessons, uh, count it. Okay. Count it. Because that's where their time is. And even, I know this will sound really strange, because it did when I heard it from the UCF admissions person, but UCF has a uh, gaming major, and I am not into gaming. I had two, guys, two boys, and I'm not into it. But I guess you can become, like, somebody that knows more than I do should probably be stepping in now. Um, <laughs> like a master that's like national and, and you regulate who's doing stuff. If you're going into a gaming major, put all that gaming time down. Now, if you're not going into a gaming major, <laughs> we don't want five hours a day gaming. <laughs> a little more. But anyway, that they said, yeah, that's that's fine because that's what your that's what your major is and that is a real level of experience that other people don't have. Um, so, schoolwork must come first, bumping back down to activities. And sometimes I see parents and kids who are hopeful that this sport, this athlete, is going to pay for his college. It is very difficult to get um, a scholarship for sports. There's a great book over there, Realities of Recruiting. And if you have an athlete that you want, to make it in college and pay for college, you need to order that book. Copy the title down and order it because he is very blunt. And he gives you specifics. If you want to be a Division I tennis player, you need to be six foot one or higher. Wow. Wow. And he will tell you how many Division I scholarships are out there. Part of the problem is if a kid is good, 
he most likely can play at a college. What happens is sometimes they will think I can only play for a Division I college. And I'm not going to do any Division II, III, or NAIA. So they could play for college. They might get money for college. But they have this idea that it can only be Division I. Understand Division I, Division II does give scholarships. But um, oftentimes they are not full scholarships at all. Football gives full. I have a student who's a lacrosse player, and he's not even getting, I mean, he's being recruited. He's not even getting a scholarship. Baseball player, no scholarship. So just be aware, it, it may not pay for college. But Division three and NAIA, they don't have sports athletic scholarships. They have what's called leadership scholarships if you happen to be on the athletic team. Um, so there is money available there, uh, but not called an athletic scholarship for that. So just be careful because sometimes the kids get so burned out during high school. I, <coughs> volleyball for the girls is what I see there. Whew. Those girls work way hard, and they want nothing to do with it when they get done. So just be careful. It may not be the answer to your college. Um, help your child uh, experience many different types of activities where they will find their passion so that they can be involved in something. I, I'm old-fashioned enough that I think high school should be a time to explore, but now they really want you to be focused and doing one thing. So it doesn't mean that if you are still exploring, you won't get into college. It does mean with the elite Top 150 schools, Harvard, Princeton, Yale's, Ivy's. You need to be, you need to have a passion and really be accelerated in whatever you're doing on that one. And as I said earlier, school isn't the only place that they can be involved. Community, church, synagogue. Um, and as I said earlier, there are other leadership roles that they can take on if they are not getting that president or vice president that they can do. Preparation for life away from home. Yes. I have one question about the um, their volunteer hours. My son currently attends JP2 right now, but he was an eighth grader here last year. And one thing that their guidance counselor put as a tidbit of information for parents is think about it now when they start doing their volunteer hours as freshmen and continue all the way through their senior year. Figure out what your child really desires, what he really is passionate about. Not passionate, I remember you said don't like the word passion, but what he really likes to do with his volunteer hours. And it's better to focus, try, on one particular thing or two as opposed to having one here, five here, three here, two here, all over the board. She is absolutely right. Example, you've got a soccer player at home, and that takes a lot of time. But if the volunteer hours end up being helping the little biddies, you're an assistant coach, or you learn to referee, and you're out there on a Saturday game refereeing, if you're over at the handicap field helping them. And I had one <coughs> soccer player who actually, watching those kids enjoy soccer, really brought a love of the sport back to him instead of win, win, win and what he was feeling with in high school. So that's an example where you're not just doing vacation Bible school and two hours here and two hours there, that your volunteer hours are still focused around your passion. Another is, I had a high school counselor at a conference I went to, and he was in a private school, and he said he loved to fish. That was, that was his passion. Okay, that's great. He can be doing the coastal cleanups, when they happen, he can be over at Joe Bud teaching kids how to fish and helping there. Again, it's using that passion of what you love and finding other areas to help um, them use that time and and for volunteer work. So that's good. That is that's very good. Um, let your child deal with consequences now. And that's hard. I know it's real hard. He doesn't study, <clears throat> gets a poor grade, 
needs to feel it. Now, my child, my older child, is very smart, and he's a national merit. He didn't care about grades. He, if he felt he knew it, it didn't matter what grade he got. I needed an A to tell me I knew it. He's like, I know it. I don't need, I don't need that. I don't, I don't really care. And so he was, I had a family member when I said, should I let him flunk the test? And she said, would it make a difference to him? I said, no. No, it wouldn't. She said, no. You keep teaching him how to study, teaching him how to write the paper, how to do the project, breaking it up into smaller parts, and make, helping him figure out how it all happens so that when he goes off to college, if you guys didn't get it earlier, I don't have to feel guilty that I didn't help as much as I could. I am not doing the work for him. I am showing him how it all comes together. But he's responsible for those grades. And sometimes, particularly for a kid, the grades do matter. A poor grade can be a real turning point in them working harder. And it's better the earlier they experience that, the better. Um, because then it can really light a fire for them. Um, help them understand money. That's a tough one. Do your kids understand money? I put in here, um, I have, we paid for uh, meal plans for our kids. And all of a sudden there were a lot of credit cards going out to dinner. And I was like, wow, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so I just, you know, sometimes even when we go out to get dinner as a family, that credit card is swiped and Johnny has no idea how much that meal costs. Maybe figure out how much you spend a month on going out to eat. Then give Johnny that money. And when it comes to the end of the month and all the money's spent, okay, what are we fixing at home? Because you haven't taken care of what needs to happen. It didn't last the full month. And I don't know about you all, but when I pay cash, it hurts a lot more than sending my name. <laughs> it hurts a lot more. So just helping them understand and I had I have a grad student um, my younger one's a grad student now and we paid for a meal plan and all of a sudden he's telling me he's going out to eat and I was like no 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 your your money doesn't go there uh, so even then um, they don't always learn the first few times that you you're trying to teach them but try to help them understand because I'm who ha does anybody here have any college kids no y'all okay Going out to eat is something they love to do. <laughs> it does not matter that they have a meal plan on campus. They still want to go out to eat. So helping them realize um, how much money that is. Visit campuses as you travel on your vacations. I've got a wonderful book over there that is a map of the different states. And it has the colleges in every city in the states. And, and so... Even if your child is not going to go to that college, having gone to the campus, I'd really love you to do an information session and the tour, because the more your child knows about different colleges, the more they know what they want. Right now, they come downstairs or they come from their bedroom when you say dinner's ready, and they have no idea that if they are living in Boston and there is no cafeteria in their dorm, at 5 o'clock on a winter night, they're walking in the dark to dinner. And they may not feel comfortable with that. They may not like having to go put a coat on to go to breakfast. But until they begin to see different campuses, and that some campuses have cafeterias, in different dorms, some campuses only have one cafeteria, and everybody goes to it, so you're going to be knowing people that are there. Um, they can't even understand that. They can't fathom that. They also are going to begin to see, do I like a big campus? Do I like a small campus? Do I like a campus where city streets are running through it? Or do I like the bubble of this is my place, this is my college, and the people who are here 
belong here. They aren't just driving through. And they can only get that by putting their feet on different campuses. Even if you go to FAM, to FSU, to Thomas, to Valdosta, they're all different campuses and they will experience different things. So I just think even if, you know, so when you're on vacation, see what campuses are in those towns and take a couple hours. Also, eat in the cafeteria. <laughs> you're gonna learn, first of all, cafeteria is big if that's all your food. If it's really rotten food, it, it, does, it is bad. But see how things are set up. Are the teachers and professors in one area and the kids in another area, or do they mingle? Are African Americans here and whites here? Are kids coming in as singles and sitting all by themselves? Or do they see friends and can go sit down? You can know a thousand kids at Swanee and go to the cafeteria and you're going to find somebody. You can know a thousand kids at UCF that has 55,000 people and not know a soul in the cafeteria when you go to eat. So go in and see how those kids, um, I, I went to one college where I saw the cafeteria worker calling the kids by name. I mean, she was cleaning up the tables. And, and she did this two or three times. Johnny, how are you doing? Susie, what's going on? And so when I went to the tour, I was like, who is this? Oh, that's Mama Susie. <laughs> and if you have a problem, she, she can help you get to the right place. That's where I want my kids to go. Where even the cafeteria people that are working there care about my kid. So stop by a cafeteria when you go to a college campus and see what it is like, how the students mingle, and what's there. Help them understand that a name college is not necessarily what makes a good fit for them that will make them thrive. And the students need to think about what type of experience they want at college. Do they want small classes? or large lecture halls? Do they want to be a big fish in a small pond? Or do they want to hide in the crowd and not be noticed? Do they want access to professors? Or do they really want relationships with professors where professors are asking groups over for dinner and getting to know them that well? Um, so, or do they want a core curriculum where they're having to fill, fill certain requirements before they go into their major? Or do they want a totally unstructured situation where they just get to pick what they want? Brown is an example that it's really loosey-goosey. And I like structure. I would be paralyzed. <laughs> I'd be paralyzed. But, so knowing these schools, when I, um, I went to Brown this fall, and I had a, somebody that I was just working with hourly, and the daughter was going to apply for him. I said, well, I'll give you a call after I've been, and let you know about it. And the mother had made the statement to me, I don't know why her friends are not applying to more top-level colleges. And um, anyway, so I came back, and I said, okay, I just want you to understand that Brown and the dormitories, it is co -ed. it is single sex by room. So there's a girl and a girl. The next room is boy and a boy, meaning it's not by floor. And the communal bathrooms are co ed. So you are getting out of the bathroom in the shower, and your next door neighbor boy is ready to get in. <laughs> That kind of turned her off a little bit of Brown. Now, the, the tour guide we had is not an admissions tour guide, but he said, our freshman year, we voted that this would be the girls' bathroom and this would be the boys' bathroom. And the comment a friend of mine made is, my son went to Wesleyan, and they were not allowed to vote that. They had to keep the co-ed communal bathrooms. 
So there are a lot of things that you all probably never even knew about. There's in one school that you can live with your boyfriend in your dorm room, if you want. Um, so there are a lot of differences from 20 years ago when you went. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to move on to finances. <laughs> now that I've quieted the crowd. Um, understand that the big name Ivy League schools, the top 150, rarely give merit aid. I mean, people all think, they hear we meet need, and they think we're going to get a lot of money. And that's where that mother, when she said, I'm really surprised that more of her friends are not applying to top-level schools. Well, some of those friends I'm working with, and they know they are not going to get the money that they need at those schools is why. And they are applying to schools so that they have enough money to pay for college. Um, so just be aware what they give in their financial aid policy. Um, what you think your need is, and what the federal government thinks your need is, or the college thinks your need is, is different. <coughs> Excuse me. And I bring this up because I had somebody that I worked with, I just did an hourly, and um, she's, they were applying to some top level schools, and highly educated, and she said, they say they'll meet need. And I said, do you know what your need is? And she was like, no. I, I know what I think it is. <laughs> and the need was, you know, 50000 I said, do you have that first 50000 to pay for school before need kicks in? Thanks. And so I just, um, so I put this in here. Um, what you think need is and what the college thinks are two different things. You can see here, you're just, this is a quick and dirty numbers. But your adjusted gross income, if it's 100000 your need does not kick in. If you have two kids, it differs on how many kids you have, until you pay the first 19522 With the state universities costing about $20,000, you are not going to get need from the state university, is how that works. At 125 it's 27000 and at 150 it's 35000 so that just gives you a rough estimate. And that's with just the FAFSA, the free application for financial student aid that the government puts out. It is about 100 questions. It goes off of your taxes. There are about 500 colleges that also ask you to fill out the CSS profile. That, that's done through the college board. And that has 250 questions. It is much more intrusive. And it, I mean, it asks retirement. It asks, I mean, it gives, a lot of times it'll give you credit if you've got younger ones at a private school. And um, you have that beach house. It's not going to help you. Uh, so you need to be aware of your school asked for the CSS profile. I had a parent, um, and there were some interesting financial things. When she filled out the FAFSA, the child wanted to go to Rice. When she filled out the FAFSA, it was about fourteen dollars or $15,000 was the expected family contribution. That worked. We could do that. When she got finished filling out the CSS profile, the expected family contribution was thirty five dollars or 40000 that really is a huge jump. I, that was unusual. Part of it is she had remarried. And what people don't understand is your current spouse's income, regardless of if he plans to pay for that college or not, is counting. And, and this child's, the stepfather was not going to pay for his college. He had his own children. So that, that played into it. Are they going by top line or, or AGI? <coughs> I don't know the top line term. This I have AGI, just a gross income as a quick and dirty. So no, normally what your salaries are, you'd be on your top line. And after you take all your deductions and write-offs, you get your bottom line AGI. AGI. So by the bottom line. Okay. AGI. But remember that financial aid and need is 
I mean, we're talking about kids who are living in apartments because they can't own a house. Be thankful that you've got a house and all of this. You may not be able to, you may have to pick your college differently, but um, it is really for need, real need. Um, and just because I give the example here that um, it doesn't mean that the college will meet your need. You'll hear some of the top schools will say, Vanderbilt will say, we meet your need. And it doesn't mean that it will not be loans. There may be some loans in that package. But it, most schools do not say we'll meet need. It's the top schools that are very, very difficult to get into. So if you have a $45,000 cost of attendance, tuition fee, room, board, books, and some spending money, and you have an EFC of 20,000, you have a need of 25,000. They may only meet 15,000 of that. So not only do you have to come up with that first 20, you have to come up with that additional 10, that there's that gap. So just understanding uh, what they think is need and what you think is need is huge. Um, and trying to find schools that, I, I, I tell kids that if they're looking for schools, if they want to get merit scholarships, if you, I don't know, have you seen the numbers of mid 50%, like the, you know, the SAT scores are the mid 50%, which it means 25% are below and 25% and are above these numbers, or a GPA that they give you. If you are in the top third, or top quarter of those numbers, your chances of getting merit scholarship is really good. And there's usually a lot of benefits that come when you're a merit scholar, special research, working with a professor in other ways, and, and money. But um, picking your school wisely um, is very important because when you have your kid apply to school and you say go ahead and apply and you have not talked about money, it's really ugly. And I know with my older boy, it was really, his stretch was definitely financially, it wasn't academically. And we said if you get a full, his number one school, if you get a full tuition scholarship, we'll find a way to make the rest of it happen. He had had a two and a half year relationship with his admissions counselor who that fall changed to another area in the college. Um, he did not get a full tuition scholarship. He got a half tuition scholarship, and that was the end of the discussion. He knew what we needed to make that happen. Um, but when that discussion does not happen, kids, I have found, really believe that when you say go ahead and apply, that you're going to find a way to make that happen. And it, it, it's very it's humiliating to say I can't pay for that. But you told me I could apply. Um, so, and don't think I had one family that I really tried to give them the money deal and, and this is how much it's going to cost. We'll make it happen, which I've learned that's, if that's being said, we're in trouble. <laughs> and um, so I said, okay, okay. What she got into? She got into Berkeley Music School, which is like the top in Boston. And her mother's comment to me was, I didn't think she'd get admitted. <laughs> and um, the head said, we don't have the money. We don't have the money. And it was, it was ugly. It was ugly. I've had that happen a couple of times. So I think sometimes if you just inoculate them and say, this is what it costs. And particularly if you have younger siblings, they don't need to all go to lower ranked schools because we spent all the money on you, darling. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, just talk with them. They're, they are big kids when you talk to them. The last thing I have here is, um, well, I have the smaller liberal arts schools are much more willing to give money. Colleges that change lives um, was originally started by Lauren Pope, who was a New York Times educational editor. There are great schools listed in here, um, and there are some terrific essays at the beginning. This is a great book to read about the schools and I've gone to several of the schools particularly in the south and a little bit in the northeast and it's like it's at the very bottom of your paper 
And it is, oh my gosh, I want to go there. And then you turn to the next school and go, oh my gosh, I want to go there. The other book, and these are the last things that are written on the notes here, it's the student, not the college. You can go anywhere and have a terrific experience. Is what are you walking in with and what's your desire? And this just has a lot of wonderful things that will help you in high school to get your kid on the right track and figure out what to do. Well, that puts us right at an hour. And um, I would like to thank Nell for coming out. We'll have time for questions and answers if y'all want to stick around. Um, you give us time to think about. <laughs> I know there's a lot of eighth grade moms in the room, so we're uh, very appreciative. Middle school um, in the office. If you have to go, feel free to go on. Um, so if you want to ask a question, please. Can you speak to how colleges consider students the public versus private high school debate? Does it make a difference other than how it benefits the students? Do they treat high schools similarly? I would say okay, many, many colleges, the admissions people read by territory, which means they go to visit. Um, when your kids get into high school, you'll know that colleges will come and visit on campus, and so they know what that high school is, is like because they visited. But in addition to that, they have to send what's called the profile, and it's kind of like the school's report card. How many free lunches are there? How many AP courses are there? How many kids go to two-year schools? How many kids go to four-year schools? Um, what are their ACT, SAT scores? And so they, they really look at the individual because if, if you go to a school that does not offer, let's say a small private school that doesn't offer very many APs, they don't penalize you. For that but but you should be taking the APs they do offer um, if they they understand that there's not many kids go to college that and the scores are lower that they want the kids to be successful they, they really do if a kid does not get into a college it's not because they don't like your child they really are trying to pick kids who will be successful at college I've got one student that has poor grades and poor test scores. And it's very difficult I'm, I'm, to find colleges that he can go to. So they, they look at, you know, what do the other kids in his class do? What are the possibilities he had? Did he take advantage of that? So the private school, if they have a ton of APs, I kind of expect you to be taken more than two. And if they don't have a ton, they understand why you're not taking that. So there's no, I don't think they're, I, they really look at the student and where the student is. Where they fell within their environment. Yes. yes. Okay. And their environment. If you've got a rural Montana, mm -hmm. that child's going to be looked at differently than New York City. Mm -hmm. So really what you're saying is did they maximize their high school experience? Whatever the high school was, did they maximize yes. what they could get out of it? Yes. My, my question is regarding the college courses, AP versus the dual enrollment. Because some high schools have in-house college courses. How okay. is there a preference on that? The colleges like AP better because you take that national exam and the AP students the AP teachers have to be certified to teach that AP course. So it should all be the same, but even if it is not the same, you have that test that you may have gotten an A in AP Physics and you didn't learn a single thing and got a two on the AP Physics exam, but somebody else got a C in AP Physics, but they got a five on the exam. Well, guess what? That five outweighs that A because I, they weren't taught. So they like that. Um, the Duke, one of the Duke assistant admissions people, they have titles kind of like at a bank. You know. <laughs>
And um, he said, why should we accept a community college credit not even taught by a community college teacher at a high school? And, and there is that. That it's, um, and so you have to look. My, my younger son had learning disabilities in English. He wasn't going to get good grades in AP Lang or AP Lit. So he took Honors English 3, and he took the TCC English classes his senior year, because on that track, that would be the terminal. And I, you know, it's not worth sending him into an AP class and getting C's. And instead, we took a lower track where he could get A's or B's. Which the next question that follows is, should you take an honors and get an A or an AP and get a B? And the admissions people say, take AP and get an A. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't help. You, you just have to be realistic. And um, you have to push. Definitely, if your kid takes an AP class and gets a C, we need to get out of that track that next year. Don't keep going that way. A B, you have to think about, you have to consider what, why. I mean, was there something going on? Lang and Lit are different. Um, so they may be able to get a higher grade than next year. Um, so, so talking with friends who have had kids in other classes, talking with teachers, and finding them. Anything else? There's another book. I haven't read it, but I've heard great things about it. And it's called Where You Go Is Not Who You Be. And it just speaks to the things that, I guess this person who is Frank Gurney, and he basically went around and spoke with CEOs and people who were in real leadership positions in life and found that they were not coming out of Ivy Leagues, that it had much more to do with other nuanced things mm -hmm. as opposed to just the well, college. I, people that know me, I love small liberal arts. Um, I just think a lot of teaching goes on in there, and I think that it's not this clawing to the top. If you have not read Ma Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, David and Goliath, Chapter 3, is, is about colleges and it's about a kid who chose, she was, she was a real scientist as a kid, and she chose uh, Brown over, I think it was the University of Mar Maryland, Baltimore County, um, because she thought more connections. Her freshman year, she didn't do great in chemistry. The teacher told her to drop it. Next year, she took it. She did okay, and then she got into organic, which was acquired, um, to go where she wanted to go. And this is really the short version. And she, um, she ended up dropping out. And what happens and what he talks about is we compare ourselves to our peers. And she forgot that she's the top 1%. She just knew she was in the bottom half of that group and forgot that she's the top 1% and gave up her dream. And so I think that I really like, he says, in essence, apply to colleges where you're the top third. Because college can be a very tough time, and if you can walk out of college with a lot of confidence, it's going to serve you well those first few years. But if you walk out feeling that you're not doing too well and you're the bottom of the barrel, it's hard. It's hard. And, and he also, it was also talked about that the, the, even colleges that did not have the brand names or the Ivy Leagues, the people that were in the top of those colleges, they did just as many publications and such as the top of Harvard. In fact, they did more publications than the top 75% of Harvard. So name, name brand, um, I'm not, it's an awful lot of money. There's 60,000, there's 55, 60,000 dollar schools. And I don't know that it's worth, uh, I don't know that my education would be worth that. So, anything else? Okay, I'm glad that um, we had the time together. Uh, Y'all have a card out there.